I hope you are having fun. Um, my name is Naveen Kumar. Uh, I'm part of EFTA's professional services, and I run uh, Performance and Integration Center of Excellence. Um, uh, earlier, last year, I got an opportunity to work with Tyler on energy transfer project, and uh, we had some, some great work done on integration side. Uh, Tyler is very passionate about ensuring that we are always following the best practices and we are following all the guidelines. And uh, when we completed that project, like, you know, we had a good learning and we thought that it is going to be a great session to share all the best practices and lessons learned from that project. So Tyler is going to take us through all the best practices, lessons learned from that project. So Tyler. Thanks, Naveen. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, like Naveen said, I'm Tyler Fadoon. Uh, I work uh, you know, on the Aptis project for energy transfer. Um, so I am the manager of IT applications for energy transfer. Uh, what I do, you know, I um, oversee a team of uh, high-skilled developers that build, you know, highly visible applications, the highly complex applications that deliver um, uh, value to our operations uh, for energy transfer. And what does that really mean? You know, I have a team that just builds really cool stuff, right? We do data visualization, we do AI projects, we do line of business applications. Um, and for our Aptis implementation, I was uh, the project manager for energy transfer. Um, in addition to being the project manager for energy transfer, uh, I also provided a lot of the technical guidance um, for how we were going to implement an Aptis solution for the company. Now, who is energy transfer? I'm sure it's a name that a lot of you have never heard of. Um, we're one of the largest MLPs in the country. Currently, we own and operate over 71,000 miles of pipeline that transport natural gas, crude, and refined products across the country. We have a massive infrastructure of facilities, and we're currently spanning 38 states. Um, as a little interesting fact about energy transfer was, I joined the company in 2011. And when I joined, we maybe had 1,000 employees across the board, across all of our offices, everywhere. Uh, you fast forward to today, or even a year ago, uh, that's close to 13,000 employees that we now have. So we've had exponential growth within the organization. And that growth, of course, has caused challenges, right? Um, from a contracting perspective, you know, we had continuous audit findings within our data. We had problems with overbilling. We had people showing or being billed for jobs that they weren't even doing. Um, and we just had no visibility for our data. So we looked at a solution. We partnered with Aptis, and we worked with Aptis to integrate the dynamic CRM system, Aptis's CLM system, into our ERP, um, which gave us automation, gave us auditability of data, and it just gave us visibility to data. And it's such a, a, a simple thing, but just being able to see your data you know, it gave us so many more answers than we had. And the outcome of this was 8% of all invoices in the past six months that have gone through our Aptis system has been flagged as having billing discrepancies. Um, and if you look at that on an annualized savings, it's $1.77 million in actual savings that the company has put back in our coffers because we're not putting that money where it shouldn't belong. Um, additionally, we have reduced audit findings, right? Uh, that was a key issue that we had before. That's gone away. Um, we have rate comparisons actually happening. We have employee verifications for people showing up on the jobs, right? These people that are showing up on the jobs are the actual people that are contracted to do the job. And finally, we've been able to streamline and manage our contracting process significantly better. Uh, that's just something that we did not have before. So. Our challenges really focus on four main areas within the company. Contracting, project management, vendors, and executive management. From a contracting perspective, you know, we just had inconsistent approvals. Uh, we had no closure process for contracts or statements of work, right? And we lacked visibility to what was actively being done. Um, from a project manager's perspective, there's just no standardization for the contract requests. Sometimes they're being done with handshake deals. Sometimes they're being done in the field. Uh, sometimes they were going through our, uh, our legal department. Uh, our project managers did not know who was coming to the job. You know, they would execute a service or a, a statement of work with a vendor, and you know, they didn't know if it was Tom, Dick, or Harry showing up on the job site. 
And one of the biggest problems that we actually had was invoices. Project managers were manually coding all invoices that they were getting. Right? Now, it's not a big deal if you're a project manager receiving one or two invoices a week, but if you're receiving 400 invoices in a week, it becomes a big deal, it becomes a big burden. Uh, so we needed to solve that. How do we automate that? And again, project managers didn't have visibility to their commitments. They knew they had projects, they knew they had open capital projects with many different suppliers, um, but they just had no easy way to track those commitments. Some of them were a little bit more due diligent working in Excel, but more often than not, it was a guess. Um, from the vendor perspective, the vendors lacked a clear view of what they were doing with energy transfer as well. You know, they didn't know what their obligations were. They didn't know what agreements they had. They were a little bit more diligent. They kept them, um, but some of them did better jobs than others. Um, the vendors didn't know what rates to use, right? Not every job is the same. You know, different jobs being done in different locations, there's going to be different rates that we were going to be paying for those uh, services. So we had a lot of inadequate billing, which of course, the inadequate billing resulted in vendor audit, right? Vendors don't want to be audited. We don't want to audit vendors. It is time consuming. Um, and the lack of controls that, are, that, that we didn't have, you know, caused us to have to do this again and again and again, which of course bubbled up to our executive management. They were the ones that had to deal with these continuous audit findings. Um, executive management didn't have visibility to data. Uh, our data was really coming from uh, one level of management, bubbling up to middle management, bubbling up to upper management, bubbling up to the executive. By the time those people got the data, it had been filtered through four different people, and you know, who knows what was really valid. And of course, they didn't actually know what they were approving. If you kind of put yourself in an executive chair, you have six contracts sitting on your desk, they're 30 pages long, you got to sign them. Do you really know what's in section two, subsection B of page 36? You know, not likely. So, uh, you know, Aptis helps solve that for us. Uh, you know, and, and that's the sort of thing that gives us increased legal risk, which obviously causes you know, lots of dollars. So our Aptis project really benefited three key areas, um, our three key stakeholders for our organization. Uh, first being our project managers, of course. We automated the invoicing. We gave them rate compliance, right? They knew that when the rate that was being charged to do the job was a rate that was actually contractually obligated to do the job. They had advanced reporting. They can do it themselves. They didn't need to rely on another group to provide the documentation. They saw rate comparisons. Not only did they have rate compliance, but now they knew what was a good rate. They could look around, right? They can look at other vendors. Um, they can do electronic approvals of timesheets. No more writing on a piece of paper, scanning it in, and attaching it to supporting documentation. And of course, they had clarity to their payments, right? Uh, before Aptis, you know, if, if a project manager wanted to know what was being done, they had to jump from one system to another system to another system to be able to get this information. Uh, now we've surfaced it all seamlessly into Aptis. They get it all at their fingertips through their dashboards. And from a vendor perspective, they also got consistency with trans uh, uh, consistent transparent uh, access to our data and their data. Right, we have multiple agreements with vendors. You know, they can log in and see the correct document. Right, they can see the correct SOW. They didn't have to try to find it. Um, they had the ability to pre-qualify on projects for us, and they got increased visibility to our, our other project managers. Right, if you had one project man or service provider that was doing, say, painting uh, for one vendor, well, there could be that same service needed by another project manager, and now they had access to that, and they can be, you know, found in the system. And from an executive management perspective, we had reduced audit findings, right? They did not have to deal with all the gaps that were there before. They had reports at their fingertips. They had dashboards so they can see this stuff real time as they go. And of course, standardization of jobs, right? A welder in Texas is a still a welder in Louisiana, is still a welder you know, in Pennsylvania, um, no matter how it's spelled, right? So we've been able to standardize that job classification. Now, for our project, we kind of came up with five main guidelines that we wanted to work with to make sure that we integrated, you know, Aptis's middle office into our own ecosystem. And the first one we wanted to look at was minimizing heavy data replication, right? We didn't want to be copying data all over the place all the time. We wanted to have a single source of truth, and we did it. We wanted to move away from expensive point-to-point -point communication. So often we see architecture where there's a spider web of arrows running around an infrastructure diagram where data is moving all over the place. We wanted to get away from that. We wanted a single point. We wanted to leverage all of our existing enterprise integration platforms. Uh, we uh, leverage Office 365, 
all of our accounts are in the cloud, so we wanted to make sure that we could leverage those uh, systems already with whomever we wanted to partner with. And of course, Aptis allowed us to do that. And you know, we wanted to adopt a true SOA principles and techniques, right? So often, I'm sure anybody who's done uh, in an implementation, SAP is notorious for wanting to do file drops, right? They want to drop a file, have a file picked up, and then have a file rigged. That's not what we wanted. We want a true handshake deal between our environment and Aptis. We want you know, a, a real-time sync of data. We want confirmation that data is going from one environment to another environment and guaranteeing that that data is clean and clear. With a file drop system, which many people proposed, uh, that was not going to work for us. And ultimately, this was a big one for me. We really wanted a system that was a configuration, not customization based. A lot of different systems that are out there, you're rebuilding from scratch, right? You go through your next upgrade cycle, you're going to be in a lot of pain. Um, we wanted a system that was just being configured for our business, not being built for our business. So it's pretty complicated, but what does it look like? It's actually not that complicated, right? We have SAP on one side of the fence, there's Aptis on the other side of the fence, and these two things are just talking to one another. Yeah, we have about 13 different points of, uh, of services, but we have one middleware tool that is doing that for us. We have SAP Pi sitting in between SAP and Aptis and transferring the data in a clean, clear, and secure, uh, and I want to focus on secure, it's a very safe way to do it. And Aptis additionally is actually consuming three different uh, third-party data sources for us that we need to do our business. Um, so while we have a very complex problem, um, we actually managed to boil it down to a really simple architecture that I was able to work with Naveen very closely and come up with. So were we successful? Yeah. Um, and we went live in Q4 of 2017. Uh, we have about 1,500 project manager or user accounts. Um, we have hundreds of external vendors logging into the system. Um, we actually see negotiation happening, right? Before, project managers just sign these uh, rate cards, saying, yeah, this is a good rate, sounds good. Now we're actually seeing project managers and directors saying, no, 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 no. We know that there's better rates available, right? And we can use this as a negotiation tool. Uh, management is significantly more aware of what's going on within the corporation, and we're already implementing phase two, even though we've only been live for six months. And again, you know, in the first six months, almost one in 10 invoices, and it's a staggering number, it blew our mind. We were, Aptis and our implementation was capturing billing discrepancies. Again, that's real savings of $1.77 million been annualized. So, not every project is without lessons, right? We learned a few things as we went. Um, we wanted, you know, we learned uh, a little bit more about how we wanted to define our integration patterns. We definitely needed to, uh, had some learnings around our um, organization security. We actually had some big twists that I'll talk about. Um, you know, only migrate what you need. That's another key thing that we, that I'm gonna get into. Challenging asking why and making decisions for the vendors and involving them. And this, this is key to getting the, those vendor adoption numbers up. So the first thing I wanted to get into is defining your integration patterns and using middleware, right? So what we did really well was we held the conversation early with Aptis, you know, in the design phase, even when we were talking business processes, we were always had the conversation, you know, how does this actually work, right? And we didn't assume Aptis knew anything about our domain, because really, why would we? we? We wanted to make sure that everybody was gonna be level set. Um, we wanted to leverage all of our existing investments, right? Well, in addition, we wanted to set ourselves up for future projects. Uh, in our case, we had SAP Pi already internally within the environment. Um, with the Aptis product, we exposed that, right? So that a third party can get in there and use the data as well. Um, which was great because within the fr we weren't even half done the project, and uh, we actually had another project kick off that needed the exact same thing. But since we had already done the hard work, they were also able to leverage our uh, our uh, setup. And one thing that really kind of got us is obviously not everything is going to be a good lesson. You know, we didn't know that CRM actually had some true, or Microsoft Dynamics CRM didn't actually have some email limitations. Uh, in our case, it wasn't able to send externally, right? Um, just the way that it was set up. Um, so we really had to do a last minute addition, and I think Naveen can attest to this, trying to figure out how to get SendGrid involved to actually provide uh, email services to external parties. Next thing we wanna get into is knowing your org security guidelines. Um, again, this is something held, hold it early, make sure that Aptis knew what we knew, make sure that everybody was on the same page or what was gonna be required. And again, we didn't assume they understood uh, our uh, security guidelines. 
is really what sounded crazy to them was perfectly sound to us, right? And case in point, halfway through the project, energy transfer was targeted by cyber, uh, a cyber uh, terrorist organization. Uh, they put us all over the internet. They said, you know, go get them. And we had to really adapt real quick on what we were doing on how we wanted to manage user accounts, how we wanted to manage uh, authentication, um, which brought us to the next point of future projects, right? That all started happening. We had challenges, so what did we have to do? We had to adapt. And uh, when they said, look, we're going MFA, multi-factor authentication across every aspect in two weeks, we didn't have the time to say, oh God, what are we gonna do, right? We had to adapt. And with Aptis, we were able to adapt really easily. Um, ask questions, right? Understand the implications and get the right people in the room. This, you know, kind of stems from the last two points. There's a lot of it going on. I'm not an IT security you know, super expert, I know what I'm doing, and I always brought the right guys in the room to say, look, this is our plan, this is what we're doing, are we doing it right? Make sure that you get those people to have the buy-in early, because those people can really come in and shut down your project, and they can cause delays, which we almost had, because we made, needed to make sure that we're gonna meet all the guidelines that were coming forward, that were changing almost weekly. And under really truly understand your audit requirements, this was something that, you know, we did stumble on, right, we thought, that we were gonna meet all the guidelines, and then next thing you know, we turned the lights on on Aptis, and we realized we were not even able to comply with our own SOX controls, right, for user audits. So what did we do? You know, we had to you know, do a mad dash at the very end, build some new customer reports that's in CRM to ensure that we were able to meet that. Wasn't something we wanted to do the week before we turned the system on, but it worked. Um, this is something that I think we did really, really well, right? We only migrated what we needed. We, again, held the conversation early on. We started identifying all of the data points, right? Really early on, not just that, hey, yeah, we have contracts and yes, we have statements of work and pieces of paper. No, we really nailed down that where are those contracts? Where are those pieces of paper? And where are those statements of work? We wanna work with them. And we also devised a really simple archiving strategy for what we weren't going to migrate. And that was really honestly something as simple as taking the old system and throwing all the databases in read-only mode, right? We just said, look, it's still there. Don't worry, don't panic, it's not going anywhere, but it's not coming over, right? And the other thing that we did is we received early backing from senior management. Uh, Kelly Henry on our project was key to this. She made this successful. She was the one that outlined that said, look, only these contracts are coming into the system. And you know what? All the statements of work that came in the old system, just finish them off in there. Let's start new, right? So we paid a little bit more in the beginning because we had to do a lot more work organizing, identifying, and seeing what we would migrate over. Um, but, you know, we paid a lot less later, right? So we had clean data for the first time in years. You know, energy transfer, we acquire companies a lot. And we're always, you know, round, uh, square peg round holding some of this data. But for the first time, we really truly had clean data. And there's a fresh start for some of our areas, specifically in the way that we manage with statements of work. The fact that we didn't bring anything over, we had a good start. We knew that on this date, in October, when the system went live, that all new statements of work were gonna be originated from this one system and we knew where to go with the data. And it really gave us a chance to organize the data, right, in a, in a way that we hadn't done before. You know, no more contracts that were called placeholders because we couldn't find the parent agreement from the acquisition, so we just had SOWs that were stuck underneath it, which is what we had in the old system. Um, now we have, really again, clean, organized data. We purged a lot of clutter. Sometimes we just had to have hard conversations with people and we had to bring them to the table and say, look, if we didn't bring this post-it note that you have from seven years ago, scanned in, what's really gonna happen? Well, nothing. So we're not bringing it. We're sorry, we're just not gonna do it. You can go to the archiving system and look at it if you ever need that post-it note, but stop hoarding data, because you see it all over the place. And in the end, you know, we had a greatly reduced complexity to our data migration. When we turned the lights on in Aptis, we didn't have to spend weeks trying to backfill data. We were able to do it in just hours. Wrote some scripts, moved the data, pushed the documents up, turned the lights on, and it, you know, there we go. All our contracts were there. And we were, had somewhere around 10,000 contracts and 40,000 statements of work. Uh, we were able to reduce that significantly at the contracts, and well, we reduced the statements of work to zero, so that was really simple for us. The next thing we wanna get into is challenging and asking why, right? Just because people do something one way doesn't mean it's always the right way. Um, this is something that we struggled with internally and I really kind of put, well, I made some friends, I made some enemies, I guess, but I challenged these guys. And a, a great example is our SAP environment. When our SAP guys wanted to do some data migration, they really wanted to write 
two sets of interfaces to do the let's migrate the SIP master data when we go live, and then let's write a second set that's going to keep it all in sync. And I said, guys, that's crazy. Why do you want to do two things? Why aren't you writing a robust set of services that not only migrates the data, but keeps it in sync? Use it one time, reuse that code. They fought me, they fought me, they fought me, and then there was that finally that aha moment, right? They got it. And when they did the SAP migration, yeah, behind the scenes, you know, it wasn't a duck on water, people kicking their feet massively trying to just stay cool. You know, it, it worked. Um, browser performance, right? This was something that we challenged after Smith. When we went to turn the system on, when we started doing our in-depth testing, IE was utterly useless. It couldn't even load, right? And this was not something we were going to accept, and we just said, no, that's not going to cut it, right? Um, and the answer of just use Chrome wasn't going to work either. We weren't going to go re-image 15,000 computers in the field, put Chrome as the primary browser, right? So we challenged Aptix. We challenged them a lot, and they succeeded. They reworked some of the CLM implementation, and next thing you know, boom, Aptix. Uh, the IE performance was good. Not only that, Chrome performance was even better, you know? That worked awesome. So we got benefits all the way across. Finally, make decisions for the vendors and involve them, right? We involved them early. We got their wants, not just their needs. We didn't want to come down as, you know, a, a, a stern parent telling our vendors this is what's going to be going on. We wanted to see what they needed to be able to work with us better because we were going to benefit as well. Um, we started our formal communication about one to two months. We found that was kind of the sweet spot, right? We and we didn't just send them an email, right? We didn't just throw an email over the fence and say, you know, wait two months and then get another email and say, welcome to Aptis, right? That wasn't going to work. So we sent an email about one, two months out. So that way when they got the next set of communication, it was already in their head. They kind of knew it was coming. They were aware of it. They weren't going to be shocked. And we spent time and money. You got to do this time and money. This isn't a freebie. You need to truly spend it. Um, for us, you know, we sent physical mailers. Not only did we do the e-mailers, but we printed mailers. We sent them across. We held road shows. We traveled to where our hotspots of where we identified most of our vendors were physically located. And we held seminars, right? What's coming? Look at Aptis. What the benefits are to you? This is why you want to be part of this system, not just, hey, Energy Transfer is going to give this to you and you need to use it and there's no ands or buts, right? We wanted to make sure the vendors felt uh, uh, important uh, in this decision. And we put a support team in place, right? We wanted to give the vendors a place that they could go to get the information from Energy Transfer. We set up a public website, aptis.energytransfer.com. You can hit it on your phones. It works right now. Um, we have tutorial videos, and we didn't just give them a big old 30-minute how to use Aptis video. We gave them nice little snippets, right? I want to create an invoice for energy transfer. Here's the one-minute Vimeo video that you can stream live to see how to do it. We recorded those all in-house. They worked great. Vendors loved them. Um, we gave them a single email address, right? You have a problem? Aptis at energytransfer.com. Shoot it. You're going to go to one group. One group is going to work with you. One group is going to work with you to solve the problem. You know, they're not going to be pressing one to talk to a director, and they're not going to be pressing two to talk to someone else, and number three to talk to someone else, or pan to talk, you know, pound to talk to the operator, right? We wanted to make sure that these guys had a good experience working with us. And it worked, right? Vendors felt invested, and our adoption rate was huge. Uh, when we started putting the KPIs of this project together, saying, what were we going to be successful? We said, if 200 vendor accounts get created in the first 12 months, this is a thumbs up project. We did well. And you know what? We went live with nearly double that. And it was just from the communications that we sent out. These vendors were contacting us saying, hey, you know what? I know you're not live yet, but I really want to get involved. I want to be part of this. And they did, and it was very successful. Um, of course, you know, we got some calls from it. We got a lot of support, but the support was there. The vendors felt that. Um, and like I said, they're not passed around, right? When they did have a problem, when they want to get access to the system, you know, one email address, one website, they know exactly where to go. So final thoughts on our implementation, right? Change is hard. When you're building something like this that is touching contracting, invoicing, uh, people coming to the job, uh, project management, executive management, right? It's hard. You need to get that opt-in, and it's, you've got to work at it. There's no easy win here. You just need to keep playing the game. You've got to involve all your key players early, right? Specifically the day-to-day -day users. And this isn't just bringing them in a room and saying, hey, guys, what do you want, right? It's bumping them in the hallway and saying, hey, Jim, you know, we're doing this contract system. How do you think it's going to go? You know, what do you think you need to see in it? 
you know, write it down. Let them see that you care, right? We did that. We talked to these guys. We brought them in rooms. We saw them. We got their field, uh, feedback. And use real examples, right? Again and again, when I'm running these projects or work with implementations, I see a lot of, you know, here's my pretend vendor with my pretend invoice and my pretend, uh, you know, payment. Well, that doesn't work, right? You put all that pretend information into your system, and when you're doing your test, you're going to get a lot of pretend results, in my opinion, right? You need to get copies of your actual production data. You need to bring it into the system because when you start using that system and you start seeing it on the screen, you're going to start identifying things that look great on paper, really don't work great on practice, right? We did it again and again, and we made changes to our implementation to adapt to the data that was actually going to be going through the system. Leverage all the tools you can. You know, this is going to be something like what we did. We used vistaprint.com, right? We didn't want to sit there licking envelopes and sending stuff to mailers. No, we wanted to use what we had. We sent it to Vistaprint, uploaded a, CVS, a CSV file of vendor addresses, and said, go. And we paid the bill. Yeah, it was a small bill, but better than licking you know, 6,000 envelopes. And sell the advantage, right? When you're talking to these guys in the lunchroom, you're talking to these guys you know, in the hallway, you've know, you got to put a salesman hat on. You've got to be the ambassador of the project. Um, that's something that I did. That's something I think our core project team did really well. You know, we sat, we listened, we talked, we sold what we were doing. We didn't just say, this is coming and hope you're going to like it. You know, we got feedback. And the final thing that I wanted to part on everyone is pictures are literally worth more than words, right? I know everybody says the opposite, uh, but, you know, diagram your processes. It sucks, right? Nobody wants to be sitting in a computer for three days with Visio drawing boxes or MS Paint or Excel or, or, or whatever it is you're doing, but it works, right? If I was to give you a process and wrote it in two paragraphs and handed it to everybody in this room, you're all going to give me a different opinion about what that process really is and what that process is supposed to do. You know, take the time. I don't even care if it's on uh, uh, graph paper. We had one of our processes that came in pencil and a graph paper, and we scanned it in, and then we drew over it to make sure that we had it in Visio. But it worked, right? We had a guy that just he doesn't want to use Visio, and that's fine, right? But now we got his process on how he did things, and it worked. And we were able to implement that process into our system, you know, exactly the way that he saw it and the way that it worked. And even then, you know, you can identify gaps in your process, right? Stuff that was being verbally described was one thing, but when you saw it on the screen, boy, oh boy, did it look different, right? And you got to see, oh no, let's put that arrow somewhere else, and it worked. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I know this was the last session, and I appreciate you all coming and hanging out. Uh, we'll be around for any questions. Thank you.